you open up your Bibles with me this morning, turn to the very last chapter of the book of Hebrews. We are indeed nearing the end of our verse-by-verse study of this book. If you will follow along as I begin reading Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably, but especially I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Shall we pray together this morning? Lord, Father, God, we ask for you to superintend, blanket and even to cover and to use your word an enveloping way in our lives and our hearts, saturating us with your truths so that we might live on them. Teach us from your word this morning. But Lord, it is on our heart today to pray for our nation. We pray your hand be upon it. And we pray not knowing what is your perfect will, we pray thy will be done. But we pray especially for that innocent man was killed yesterday at the assassination attempt and for his family. Lord, reach down to them, minister to them, comfort them, provide for them, even through us. And for the wounded as well, Lord, be with them in their hospital beds, their recovery time. Help them, O oh Lord God. May in each case, including the case of the wound that was suffered by our former president, Donald Trump. May it bring their mortality close to their minds and their need for belief in Jesus Christ and salvation to be of a paramount urgency. And if they know you already, Lord, then increase their faith. Bless us now, O Lord God, as we study your word together pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes, sometimes pastors are easy to love. And sometimes pastors are easy to hate. That's the truth. I didn't ask for an amen on the second in total fear. (laughs) Paul, speaking to a young pastor whom he had raised up in his ministry, in his second letter to him as he was ministering to the Ephesians, he said in 2 Timothy 4, 2, Keruxon ton logon. Epistemi, eukairos, akairos. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Sometimes pastors are easy to love. They preach the word and you are fed. When they lead you to the Lord and you are fulfilled. When they convince you, same way as we are called on to obey those who rule over you, that word means to be persuaded by the words that they teach. 
But then it says rebuke. Leadership requires leadership. Meaning, someone has to say when it's right and when it's wrong. Or when you're right or when you're wrong according to the scriptures. So that you turn from that way and then they're much more easy to hate. Exhort. You can have both a positive feature to encourage in the Lord, but it can also have a negative feature, get up and get busy for the Lord. And then Paul's charge to Timothy with all makthumia and didoke, with all long suffering and teaching. Pastors have to be long-suffering because sometimes they're easy to love and sometimes they're easy to hate. Yet teaching, or didache in the Greek, which we often have translated as doctrine, teach them the truth of God's doctrines. This is the last installment of our relating to others in the Word. In the Word. Our relationship with people is a relationship not only with those people, but how we relate to them in the Word of God and with the Word of God. Last week we looked at a relationship with those ruling over us with the Word. Pastors, leaders, elders, whatever you want to call them, this is that position. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. So last week, we were exhorted to allow our walk with Christ to be persuaded by the words that they proclaim. The words that they proclaim from the Word of God. This morning we are going to look at a prayer request, a command even to pray for the word to persuade their walk. First allow yourself to be persuaded by the word, now pray that your pastors, your leaders, your rulers, as it is translated here in the New King James Version, be persuaded by the word as well in their walk. Look at verse 18. The writer of Hebrews in conclusion says, pray for us. Not just pray for me, pray for us. I who minister, who am writing this to you, who minister to you, but also those who are with me in this task for you. Pray for us. In the Greek, it is an imperative, which we normally understand to be the form of a command. To pray it means to do this because God wants you to do this. That is certainly true here. God wants you to pray for your pastors, for your leaders, for your teachers. But when we look at the way in which it is written and is so often written by others in the New Testament, we find that this imperative also has the element which only an imperative can, because an imperative has force to it. as the will behind it. But more than that, it has necessity underneath it and through it. So not only is this a command from one who is and has been their ruler teaching them. For in verse 22, he's going to ask them, and I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I've written to you in few words. Bear with this. Listen to it. 
He is calling on them. He is crying to them. He is begging them to pray for he and those who are ministering with him. The imperative for prayer is a cry for prayer. It is a call, if you will. Please help me in what God's given me to do. Listen to the same sort of lamenting cry, even in the same formula, if you will look at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 30, we read the Apostle Paul saying these similar words. Now, he says, I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together, listen, with me in prayer to God for me. It is a prayer request by way of exhortation. Please strive together with me. It is an acknowledgement that no minister ministers alone and no minister can minister alone, but the great weakness and the great need and the great desire to know that God will be undergirding him through the prayers of those to whom he ministers. In verse 31, Paul goes on with the purpose of it. Strive together with me in prayers to God for me that I may be delivered, listen, from those in Judea who do not believe, from the constant resistance of non-believers even in the area in which Jesus ministered in which Jerusalem lies and his own people reside, and that I, my service for Jerusalem, listen, may be acceptable to the saints. The saints will accept me and they will hear the words and I will have good ministry. Verse 32, that it may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Again in his writing to the Ephesian church, in Ephesians chapter 6, notice right after he tells them about the spiritual battle and the armor that they need to be employing in the battle against the forces of darkness in the spiritual realm. Ephesians 6, verse 18, exhortation to be praying always with all supplication in the Spirit. And then we skip down to the personal portion of it in verse 19. And for me, he asks, and pray for me, and what should you pray for him? Listen, that the utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Notice how this cry for prayer is also a cry for the word of God. When you pray for your leaders, when you pray for those who rule over you, those who teach the word of God to you, it's all about the word. So that the word can work in them and out through them for the work it is designed to do. Your relationship with others in the word is a relationship of prayer so that the word can go out. Paul said to Timothy, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season at all times. And Paul sits in prison as he writes to the Ephesians and says, I am an ambassador in chains. I've been sent out before Christ the King. I am an ambassador and I've landed in jail for it. It is upon me to be quiet. It is easy for my flesh to say, shut up. It is easy for me to backpedal off the truth of the message that demands that I convince, I rebuke, I exhort. 
Pray for me so I don't waffle. Pray for me that I may speak boldly as I ought to preach with a good conscience. With a good conscience. Our text says pray for us for we are confident that we have a good conscience. Colossians says, chapter 4, verse 2, Paul again, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open the door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. His conscience is bound by preaching the word in its fullest sense of truth with nothing left out and not have his conscience burning in him that he has failed on some line to do that or even to live that which he does and preaches. Paul, in speaking to the Thessalonian church at the very end of that letter to them, the first one, he says it very succinctly and perfectly. Brethren, pray for us. It's a cry for prayer. It is a cry for help. Christians wonder, what can we do for our pastors? What can we do for our leaders? What can we do to keep the word of God going forward? Well, the imperative is there. And the cry is there. Please, please. Pray for us. And in the second letter to the Thessalonians, more is given finally, brethren. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith. Leaders stand between you and an enemy. They take the hits which the unreasonable deliver. That wicked men never tire of using because not all have faith. The cry for help is a cry for prayer. That his conscience may be clear in preaching the word. The purpose, even of this conscience, the purpose is for a persuaded conscience. Listen to this. For we are confident that we have a good conscience. We are persuaded that we have a good conscience. No, the conscience is an amazing thing, isn't it? See, conscience is one of the things that every man, woman, child has that is inexplicable, isn't it? It's inexplicable apart from God. The evolutionist can say all he wants about evolving from different things and going to a higher level of being, if you will, but they can't explain conscience. And they can't explain that there's only one creature on the face of this earth that has one. Animals do not have a conscience. Oh, but my doggy looked so sorry when it whittled on the floor. Um, they're used to your reaction. They're not repentant. It could happen again. And nor do they have or lose any salvation over it. They're different. One of the reasons we know we are men created by God and that we know that God exists is because our conscience tells us so. In Romans chapter 2, Paul says of the conscience, it either is accusing us or excusing.
excusing us for what we do and what we think. We know right from wrong from the beginning of our lives. A conscience. And the more that the word of God is poured into us, the more our conscience becomes sensitized to what we should accuse ourselves of or excuse ourselves of. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says this, Sounds a little prideful at first, but listen. It says, for our boasting is this. If you're going to accuse us of boasting, of being prideful, he said, our boasting is this. The testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity. In simplicity, opposite, complexity. Trying to be so erudite, so refined, so high, so above. No, we came to you simply, listen, and in godly sincerity. Not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. And more abundantly toward you. They have a good conscience in bringing the gospel and living the gospel that they preached. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul speaks to Timothy and he says in verse 5, he says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love. Remember that. The purpose of the commandment is love, now listen, from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Now, if we just stop there, you'd be wondering, well, what's he talking about? He's talking about a commandment that he had just given to Timothy. What is that commandment, you ask? Let me show you 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Paul says to Timothy, as he begins this letter, As I urged you, when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may listen, that you may, are you paying attention? That you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give Heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. Sometimes pastors are easy to hate when they do what they're supposed to do. Charge some. That's not a small word. Like, let's have a little conversation. Let's pay pity patty with this, and when you leave, you won't know what I really want from you. No. Charge some that they teach no other doctrine, no other teaching than what is taught by the Word of God that I gave you, nor give heed to fables, endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in the faith. See, it's related to the word and good conscience. Verse 5, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience. Timothy, don't fail your people by waffling on the truth when it needs to be applied correctively, sometimes pastors are easy to hate. Who likes to be rebuked? Raise your hand. Who wants to be corrected? Raise your hand. Who wants ice cream? Raise your hand. <laughs> Different response. Jack in the back, you're with me, baby. He's listening. (laughs) 
it's surprising how word-oriented all of this is in the relational aspects one to another. Peter speaks to all believers on this wise so similar to the way Paul is speaking and the writer of Hebrews. Listen, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts. This is for all of us. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope is, that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to speak the gospel. Always be ready to tell them your testimony with meekness and godly fear. Having a good conscience. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. See, if you live in the word and you're teaching the word, then your conscience will be clear. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than to suffer for doing evil. So pray for your rulers, for your teachers, for your pastors, for the purpose of that the word will persuade their conscience and they will be persuaded in it. Now are they saying that their conscience are clear, that they have nothing wrong with them? Are they so arrogant so as to present themselves as never having transgressed the word of God? Is that what he's saying in Hebrews? Is that what Paul was saying in these numerous accounts of having a good conscience? Well, if they are men like we are men, they sin even as men in leadership, even as men on appointed leadership. So if no, then what are we to make of this good and clear conscience that he's talking about? Let me show you. Let me give you an example from the book of Acts, from the life of Paul. Acts chapter 23, in verse 1, Paul is on trial. He's before the Sanhedrin. He's being falsely accused of being one that's denying the law of God. He's on trumped up charges, and we pick it up. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Let me tell you, he's not claiming perfection. He's claiming something else. Chapter 23, verse 2. Now listen to the reaction of the high priest. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, obviously after he's just been hit in the mouth, Paul says, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Um, I reckon he was mad. I reckon he was real mad. He has just given an insult. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and you do not command me to be struck. And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Now, I don't want to get into a study of all that, but he was not supposed to have had him struck during his testimony at all. Punishment is meted out after the trial, not during the trial, when the judge doesn't like what he hears. Now I want you to pay attention to what happens here because Paul has transgressed. Verse 4, And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? So Paul has just made a mistake. He sinned. Now listen to what Paul does with regard to conscience. Then Paul said, quote, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written... You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So what are we learning? Paul is a sinner. 
in the midst of a trial where they smacked him in the mouth while he's trying to give his testimony. And he comes back with a curse, if you will, you whitewashed wall. He finds that he has just transgressed the law. What do we now learn about a good conscience? See, the fact of having a good conscience is that you, not that you never sin. If that were the case, every single person and every single pastor and every single leader would always be without a good conscience. So what is a good conscience? A good conscience is one that responds in this way to his own sin. What did he say? I didn't know. And even though he did not know that this man was the high priest, yet he charges himself by the word of God saying, it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. He immediately was piqued in his conscience, quoted the scripture, the word of God that had sensitized his conscience so that he knew he was wrong and it was a form of confession. Leaders are easy to hate when they fail. But leaders are also easy to love when they readily admit their failure according to the word. It's called repentance. That's a good conscience. Let's move down to conduct. To conduct. Oh, forgive me, I forgot a verse. Let me show you how Paul explains this, how his conscience works. Acts 24, forgive me, verse 15. Paul says, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, Paul says, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. He's not claiming perfection. He's claiming direction. That it is his desire that when his conscience accuses him and the word of God is behind it, that he confesses it and he turns from it and then his conscience is clear. Isn't that the way it works with us too? And when that's the case with us, then we're easy to love. And then leaders are easy to love. And now to conduct. First, the conscience. Pray for us where we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things. But then it says desiring to live honorably. Desiring to live honorably. Oh, brothers and sisters, what prayers are needed for this to be realized in any man? What supplications, what turnings to God, what bended knees and cries forth for pastors, for leaders in the church need to be raised up that they can live honorably. How does that work? What is living honorably? Let me give you a couple of scriptural examples. First comes from Romans chapter 12. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Listen to this. If it is possible, listen to this. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now that's honorable. You know what else it is? Excruciatingly difficult. That means no matter what other men do, you do everything to make peace. No matter if they don't reciprocate wanting peace, you seek peace. 
in all relationships. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Oh, boy. I'll tell you, yesterday, when someone shot at our former president, reactions took place. Reactions desiring justice. Vengeance. I think we're going to see the outplaying of that across the news and the media as they seek to lay blame. Let me tell you something. God has not given that into the hands of the church. He's given it into the hands of government to do justice. So we pray that they will do justice. But as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. But rather give place to wrath means don't give it a place. Excuse me. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, what is it to live honorably? Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. That doesn't mean you're burning to the ground and that's a good way. I'm going to toast this dude so I'm actually going to be nice because I want him to burn up. That's not what this means. This means that you will work his conscience, his inner heart. For he will know that in his injustice and in your peace seeking, he is convicted. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Give them the word. One more, Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. That's honorable but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Pray for me. Pray for us. Pray for your leaders. They might live honorably for they are flesh and the flesh is hard to fight. Letter C in your notes. Verse 19. Persuade the Lord to restore your ruler, your pastor, your leader. Verse 19. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Somehow he's not with them. We don't know historically where he is or why. We don't know if he's in prison. He speaks of Timothy getting out of prison. But we don't know why he's not with them. So this begs the question in my mind is if he wants them to want him to be restored to them, does this mean that Christ's sheep require shepherding? I mean, I ask that question. Do Christ's sheep require shepherding? That he would ask that he'd be restored to them? Don't Christ's sheep have Christ? Listen to John 10, verse 14. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Well, if you have that, what do you need any other shepherd for? And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, Jesus said. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. See? One shepherd. Do we need more? Therefore, verse 17, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. 
No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. If they have that, what do they need more? In John 10 now, verses 26, he speaks to those who do not believe, these Pharisees, these scribes, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I think that's important, isn't it? Christ is a shepherd and you're his sheep that you would listen to his voice and do what he says, go where he says to go. He said, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any one of them be taken out of my hands. Isn't Jesus enough? What is this thing? Obey those who rule over you. What is this? Pray for us, these rulers in the church. What is this? Verse 24 in Hebrews 13. Greet all those who rule over you. What is this rule thing? What is this leadership stuff? We've got Jesus as our shepherd, don't we? Today many are saying just that kind of a message. It's happening more and more across the United States and the world. The people are saying, well, we have Jesus as our shepherd. We have the Holy Spirit in us to help us know the word. What do we need pastors for? And in some ways we can sympathize with them because of the great atrocities that have taken place with so many who have called themselves pastors. The radio waves are full of charlatans who are not with good conscience, preaching the word. They're not doing as they should, never failing to preach the whole counsel of God, as Paul said to the Ephesian elders. They're saying no. Throw off those things. And, and so you are rightly so to be skeptical of those who call themselves leaders and pastors in the church. For whatever reason, there are so many today, including that reason I just cited, that they are rejecting and rebelling against the shepherding role of local church pastors. They say, I'm done with organized church. They begin their little rebellious conclaves of the prideful, if you will. And generally they're led by someone who is uncalled according to the word of God, unqualified according to the word of God, and untrained according to the word of God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I question sheep that don't want the organized church when it's Jesus Christ that organized the church. Let me show you how he did that in a brief way. First, right away, same book, John chapter 21. Jesus is going away. Jesus will ascend into heaven and no longer be on the earth. And he has a horrible disciple who though he claimed to never be one who would leave Jesus even unto death, yet three times in a row he denied that he knew Jesus Christ. Jesus then brings him to a breakfast of fish. On a beach. In John 21, 15, and when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Is that not the voice of the shepherd? And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, tend my 
sheep. Isn't that not the voice of the shepherd? And then in verse 17, and he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, notice three denials. Notice three restorations. Simon, son of Jonah. Oh, how this must have tested his heart. How this must have been upon him. Do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. My sheep know my voice. My sheep follow me. They follow him to his church that he organized with leadership. And the first of those leaders was Peter, the restored sinner who, by the way, would sin again. Imperfect shepherds placed over imperfect sheep by the perfect shepherd. Let me tell you something. Christ delegated shepherding care the shepherding care of his flock to local pastors in local churches. My sheep hear my voice. 1 Peter 5. Now Peter speaks inspired. Verse 1. The elders who are among you, which means there are Elders among the church. That is a position of oversight. Obey those who rule over you. Pray for them. Elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, listen to what he says by way of command, shepherd the flock of God which is among you serving as overseers. To have oversight means there's something under. My sheep hear my voice. The shepherds must hear it and exercise shepherding care and oversight for the benefit of the body. For that would be unprofitable for you, said in verse 17, if you don't let them do it. Not by compulsion they're supposed to serve, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. There's no near reward. There's a far reward for being a ruler, for being a shepherd and pastor in the church. My sheep hear my voice, so my sheep go to church under a shepherd not under a self-appointed home meeting of somebody who thinks they don't need church. Acts 20, the Ephesian elders come to Paul before he goes to be executed. Therefore, take heed to yourselves, Paul says, and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. How do they get to be overseers? The Holy Spirit makes them overseers. To shepherd the church of God, listen, which he purchased with his own blood. Paul says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Do God's sheep need shepherds? Savage wolves will come in you, not sparing the flock. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us that you might be safe. 
that you will be protected by the word of God, by men whose consciences have been persuaded by the word of God and who live the word of God, lest you be rended by the wolves in the world. Any Christian who thinks they are strong enough to walk alone is the most foolish of sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And the chief shepherd said to the shepherds that would come, Go be shepherded. And to the shepherds, shepherd them. And it is only the worst sort of rebellion that would say to Jesus, No, your church is too broke. I won't go. Pray for us. Brothers and sisters, pray for me. Who am I to watch out for your souls? What will become of me when I have to give an account? Pray for me. Fear for me. Sometimes I'm easy to love, and sometimes I'm easy to hate. Let's pray. Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We bow before your authority and before your majesty, for we call you Lord. And as our Lord and as our Master, command us, Lord, for we desire to obey. Let us fall in line under your order for the church and let us pray for those you put over us in the church that we would be not shepherdless either from their fall or from their complete failure or from their fear that all is futile and their work is for nothing. We pray that we would be people of prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.